uh, Lorraine is also a senior researcher for race, which is the research of Australian close encounters too. So would you please welcome Lorraine here tonight. Hi Lorraine and thanks for agreeing to Skype in tonight. I really appreciate you taking the time. Thank you for inviting me, Cheryl, and giving me this opportunity to showcase the group. Thank yes. you very much. Yeah, it's, been, it's great, it's great. So, um, you've got some cases that you'd like to share with us tonight, and I believe you also had some of your own experiences too, so take it away, Lorraine, and, and tell us what you've, what you've got. <laughs> Almost. Well, I thought, um, like, we're in, um, in the field group. Um, we conduct investigations and expeditions for research at least twice a year. Uh, we camp out in the wilderness a lot of the times. It's the Blue Mountains or west of the Blue Mountains. Um, we've had our own experiences as a group, as well as me personally. But as a group, we've had experiences. Um, we've got lots of footage and photographs. Um, we've had physical trace evidence. Um, it's a lot of our work is archived on DVD, um, particularly um, one case um, where there was myself. What what we do on these um, expeditions, we um, we cover the night sky in couples. So we we'll have two watch for two hours and then come back to base camp, another two will watch for another two hours, come back to base camp and so on through the night. And I think there was myself and another member of the um, group, we were actually on the midnight to two o'clock watch. And um, at the time, it seemed that we hadn't been there for very long. Um, it was probably, we thought, around one o'clock, and this double layer of golden lights just floated across the Baragarang Valley, across the Baragarang Lake, which is Sydney water supply, and it's a no-fly zone. At that time of the morning, beautiful. It looked absolutely beautiful. And of course, we're saying, I said, switch the camera on, get the camera. And he said, but the camera won't go on. It's not working. You've got to keep the camera going on it. And anyway, apparently, we got the last few seconds as it disappeared. Next day, we realized that it had disappeared into the mountainside not above the mountains, but into the actual mountain itself. It's an area in the Blue Mountains which is said to have a base, an underground base, and Rex Gilroy often speaks about this area. Anyway, I, I actually did, we got a still shot of it. I don't know if you can actually see that. It's a typical... Um, Saws the shade with the dome on an angle as it moved in. So we got the last couple of seconds of it. But um, we were excited, you know, oh wow. So we ran back to base camp and we weren't very far from base camp. There was another two members and they were asleep in the tent. So we were excited, wake up, wake up, we've caught something on video, we've seen something. Oh. No, it's too late. Go back to sleep. Do you know it's four o'clock? We said, what? No, no, it's not four o'clock. Oh, it's about one o'clock. You know, no, it's four o'clock. So somewhere along the line, we would lost a couple of hours, probably about three hours. So we, I, I've often noticed, even with reports that come from people that they see the object up close, personal, two layers of golden lights, and then nothing gets videoed until the last couple of seconds as it's leaving. So I believe it's an abduction scenario between seeing it up close and personal, and then as you capture the last couple of seconds is when it's leaving. 
but I've found that with a few cases. So actually experiencing it ourselves was quite amazing. Yes. And did you, how many were in that group? There was only four at that particular expedition, but there's been as many as nine of us. There's six of us at the moment. I mean, um, Darren Terry moved to Queensland, and of course, Dominic McNamara moved to Adelaide. So there's one, two, three, four. There's five of us in Sydney, but Darren Terry always comes on our expedition. So I was hoping he would be there tonight. Yeah, no, he's not here at the moment. So, um, as I was saying, that's a case like that we experienced ourselves. We actually had that. We were interviewed the next morning and we put it on the DVD along with the footage. So that is, um, oh, that's something that I haven't told your um, um, <laughs> group that we don't write books. We decided to archive footage on DVDs. So we have three um, series. A, Tri trilogy of DVDs with a number of cases, three, four, about six cases on this particular set. Interesting enough to recreate. So some of it has original footage and we've recreated the entire event itself. That particular um, case is on one of the episodes. The first episode um, is we called it in the beginning. It was um, a lady got in touch with us and wanted to tell us um, something that happened to her back in 1963. And the older cases are always interesting because it's pre-space race. It's pre-ufology, but pre not everybody knew about UFOs or what's going on in space in 1963. There wasn't a lot of uh, literature about, out there about it. I don't think there was anything, really. So for this lady to write to us, she wanted to tell us what happened to her and her family in 1963. We decided it was a good enough case to um, recreate an archive onto one of the DVDs. And what happened was, she, there was her, her brother, and her mother and her father were on a camping holiday. So they were, and most of the abduction cat scenarios do happen in rural areas. They were out in a rural area of New South Wales. Um, they were talk, actually looking at the sky, talking about um, what star is that? You know, and they saw this, and there was a train um, station or train lines not far from their camping um, ground, and they could see lights from the train. And they, it kind of upset them to have the trains coming through. So they were told there were no more trains that night, and suddenly they saw a light coming towards them in the sky. In the distance, it didn't look like it was in the sky. And they said, oh, no, here's another one of those trains. And they were watching it approach them, and then they realised it was too high up off the ground to be a train. So then they discussed maybe it could be one of those newfangled helicopter things that they'd heard about. But, oh, they'd only seen one of them, so they weren't sure. And as it got closer, they realised it was the saucer shape, it had windows, it was illuminating light. They were terrified, especially the father, because 1963, it was his job to protect his family. He was the man of the house. So he told the family to get up, run, get inside, go and grab my gun. And of course, they're saying, gun? And um, the next minute, I think they all ended up on the ground. Um, it was a scenario where they didn't remember what happened, but they knew something had happened. 
Uh, same thing again, close encounter, then on the ground, not remembering anything, and then seeing it taking off and moving away in the distance. Mm -hmm. um, this little girl, the lady who I was talking to, was a little girl at the time, and she had a headache, she felt sick. She even asked her mum and dad, have I been to hospital? She felt strange somehow. And the next day in the newspaper, they actually, the parents knew something had happened, but they didn't know what to tell the children. And the father was totally perplexed because it's his job to protect the family. And he didn't know what was going on. So the next day in the newspaper, they read um, about other encounters and sightings of this object that had happened all the way along the coast. So we actually um, delved into the newspaper and got the actual reports from the newspaper onto the DVD. So it was a true encounter um, back in 1963. Mm -hmm. We heard about it when the lady was much older. And that's kind of missing time. We have three episodes of missing time on there. The um, Another episode was happening to a couple when they were driving along the lonely road. They left at 11 o'clock. Um, should have been a half hour trip. The car stalled, all, lost all electrical, the usual scenario that we've heard about. Flash of light in the car. They remember thinking, what are we going to do? We're out in the middle of nowhere. Who's going to know we're here? And then the next minute, all the lights and electricals come back on the car, and off they went. Except when they got home, they found it was 3 o'clock in the morning. So they don't, yeah. We've heard a lot of those cases. Um, the other one was um, very close to where I actually lived. And this um, this was a young baker. And he, he was an apprentice baker on his way to work. Um, midnight, he started work. Um, <clears throat> I think he left home about 11.30. He didn't live far from his work. Um, he was driving along the road and he saw a light coming towards him and he kind of veered off the road and the light swooped over the top and he could see it disappear in his rear view mirror. Same kind of thing again because he pulled up on the side of the road, shaken. He could see the bakery. He was It was at the top of the hill. He was not that far from work at all. Um, started off again when he got to work, the boss said to him, um, what do you think you were doing on the side of the road there? He said, what do you mean? He said, I, I, did you see the light? Did you see what happened? He said, what light? Well, no, he said, well, I saw you sitting on the side of the road for 40 minutes. What's going on? He said, no, I wasn't. He said, I just pulled over because this happened. Dude. <laughs> and uh, his boss said, oh, yeah, little green aliens, that's your excuse, blah, 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 you know what they like. So. Anyway, the next night, the boss said to him, hey, your UFO's back. He said, what do you mean? He said, come on outside. So they went outside, looked out the back of the bakery, and there was a bright light in the sky just hovering there, kind of watching them. How many times do we hear it was sitting there watching me? Yes. Yes. And, uh, oh, goodness me, you know, what, what, what is that? So they said, let's go and investigate. It was moving down over the car park. So they ran down over the car park to have a look and see if they could see where it was going. It seemed to be coming down low. So when they got down to the end of the car park, there was three of them. 
So there was three witnesses to this. They could see shadows in the car park and it was like somebody was moving around the cars and casting shadows, hiding behind the cars, moving in and out. And they were freaked out, totally freaked out by what the hell is going on here. And when they got back to the um, bakery, the, the door was only open like a couple of inches. And when they opened the door, there was a whole stack of newspaper completely in shreds. Completely shredded, tied up, bundled up and placed in the back of the bakery. They have no idea where it came from, who could have put it there. There was nobody around. They investigated, called out to these shadows. There was nobody there. So that, that, that's totally unexplainable, totally unexplainable. That reminds me of a case that we had here, well, must be some feedback. Uh, we had here where um, a young man got up out of his room, um, walked out into, from the bedroom out into the lounge room and kitchen, and every stick of furniture in the house was completely broken up into large splintered pieces and piled up in, in piles and all he could think of was, oh my God, my, my stepfather is going to kill me <laughs> when he gets home. And of course, uh, and he couldn't explain every single piece, which is splintered. And um, so he, he went back to his room, he was so shocked and just sitting there and he heard his stepfather um, come home and he, and he walked in, heard him walk in the door, heard him walk through the house. Meanwhile, the young man had shut his bedroom door um, and then the stepfather pulled out a couple of drawers here and there, he could hear that, and then he walked back out again. And the young man thought, well, that's really odd. He was just waiting for him to scream. And he came, went back out of his room and here's all the furniture back in normal pieces again, like full pieces of furniture. It sl slightly smacks of the same sort of thing, doesn't it? Yeah, it does. Yeah, it was very strange. It is. There's a lot of strange happenings in the UFO field. There are. It's paranormal, you know. Yes, yeah. And you investigate a lot of the, the paranormal side of it as well. Yep, yeah, we do. Um, on the same um, series as our... Um, it's my dad, sorry. It's <laughs> on the same series... Um, that we had the uh, Blue Mountains encounter. We have an investigation at a hospital in the Blue Mountains, which is um, an old psychiatric hospital. It was part of the quarantine station back in the old convict days. And um, we, we actually um, contacted Spirit there. Now, I don't know if you know the... EMF meters, the electromagnetic interference um, meters, um, how they can, um, we've got an old uh, analog one, it's not one that goes beep, 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 but it's one that has a dial and it shows 1 to 100 uh, electromagnetic interference and um, we it, where it's actually down and when it's nil and then it kind of spikes you know if there's electromagnetic interference it spikes well we we contacted a spirit it was spiking so we started asking questions and he used the meter to communicate with us and left was yes and right was no and we captured it on camera uh, there's there's no way that that will happen with a digital meter yeah. and and he was answering yes and no through the digital meter so that's evidence that there is something whether it's a spirit or not it could be interdimensional and i do believe that a lot of spirits 
aliens, beings, light beings, they are interdimensional. Um, oh, just recently, um, I had a case, a lady, her mother actually telephoned me and she said, you have to do something for my daughter. She's a psychic medium and the aliens are going to take her. Oh, okay. Well, I ended up speaking to the daughter and she has been, you know, channeling with her guides, Odin and Seth. And it wasn't until eight months ago she realised that they weren't spirit guides, but they were aliens. They, they were greys, they told her. They've been using her in the breeding program. They have been impregnating her, incubating babies. She said as many as five babies have been incubated inside of her and then after two months they take the babies and she said they're using her because of her certain type of DNA. She, she called it XYZ. I don't know what that is but she said XYZ and that's why they're using me. And she said they want me to go to um, the ship or planet or dimension, wherever they come from. So I asked her where do they come from, she doesn't know. I told her to ask them where they come from at least. And they want to take her there to nurture, nurse and look after and teach the children. And they also want to use her in their reproduction program. So I said, I, I really didn't know what to do, you know, with this case. This is something I've never heard of before. Usually if um, a lady woman is taken and impregnated and then the um, baby is taken, they usually return to Earth, to their family. They might sometimes take them to the ship and thank you, Dad. <laughs> they might sometimes take them to the ship, introduce them to their children, um, ask them to nurture them. Jane Pooley is one of those um, ladies who's in the breeding program. But I've never heard of them wanting to take them full and not bring them back. And she's petrified. If it's true, especially her mother, you know. So that I'm going to probably speak to Jane and see. If she, have you ever heard of that before? No, that the the witnesses take it away. What they want to take her away and not return her. Yeah. 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 I mean, I've heard of cases where, I mean, there's the classic case of Elizabeth Clara who had a child with. Um, an extraterrestrial and she went to live on the planet for three years with him when, after she had the child, blah, blah, blah. Um, but not where she wouldn't be returned. She had, well, she actually had to come back because her heart didn't work properly on that planet or something. So, um, yeah, I, no. I mean, if they wanted to take people away and not return them, then you wouldn't hear about it, would you? Because they'd be gone. No. <laughs> so, yeah. Well, no about it she'll tell us if, if that happens she's very worried yes yeah. but um yeah i haven't heard of that case so i'd be interested if you could send me a I little will. bit about that yeah um, it's a classic case back from the 60s i think if she was okay. in she was a south african woman mm. okay i'd be interested to show gary that yeah. maybe it might put her mind at rest if she thinks that maybe it'll be just for a short period of time. That's a worry, isn't it? That's it a is a worry, worry. yes. Yeah, because, I mean, um, also, they've blocked her from um, her spirit guides. Right. She, she was in touch with her mother, um, sorry, her grandmother, and other spirits. So this is how paranormal and alien 
come into place as well. Yes. I mean, she was totally, did not know that they were great. Yes. She thought she was in contact with spirits. Mm -hmm. So they're very overlapping. You the, really don't know who you're talking to. Yes, and that's, I find that comes up quite a bit. And I was very interested to hear when I was at Paracon in, this year in May at Katoomba and I was speaking to a, um, I guess you'd say a ghost hunter and she and they were doing table tipping and all sorts of those sort of trying to get in contact with the dead and she said she was starting to think that she was actually communicating with extraterrestrials, not the dearly departed and she said actually I don't know who we're talking to. That's um, right. Yeah, and from, from what that from what the response had been, that was how she deduced that. So who knows? Yeah. It's an interesting thought. Especially if they are interdimensional. Mm -hmm. now, I mean the, the string theory, mm -hmm. like the guitar strings, yeah. that all vibrating on different levels. Yeah. So we can enter um, extraterrestrial level vibrating on one string, yeah. another string, the vibrations could be on the spirit level, and then another string vibrating on the interdimensional level. So, you know, you really don't know. Mm -hmm. Well, if we're, if we're talking about a non-ordinary reality, then we don't know what who populates that, who or what populates that, do we? Um, no. It could be quite a varying degree of beings in that reality. Yeah. And I was reading Martin's theory um, just last week, his timeline for past, present and future, mm -hmm. you know, and there is no past, present or future in, in, in the um, in the time zone, in space, we give past, present and future, we give time, but it's all one. Yes. It's a cosmic consciousness yeah. and it's all, all connected, all one, no time, present, future. There's probably three types of greys as well, past, present and future. Because you hear of so many different types of greys. Some are from here, some are from there, some are from the future, yes. the present, the past. Yeah, it's all, it's all very confusing. It is, it is. The more we ask, <laughs> the more you, <laughs> no answers. The more you hear, the less you know. <laughs> yes. Lorraine, I'm going to have to uh, wind you up there because um, I've got to go on to our last presenter for the night. But um, thank you very much for your time. It's been a pleasure. Thank you Thanks for sharing. For yeah. not, I've got so much more to share. I know. <laughs> we'll have to have another night and, and do all that. <laughs> thank you, everybody. Thanks, Lorraine.